But the ESV version, that's the English Standard Version, of the same verse says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning. That's a difference. Now that is the key there. Not that he doesn't sin, but he won't keep on and on and on doing it, the same thing over and over again, because he will realise that when he does sin, the Holy Spirit will convict him of sin, and he will repent, turn away from that sin, he won't just carry on doing it. And there was a, I, several years ago, I um, read in a newspaper about a Salvation Army Cup, and I'm not picking on the Salvation Army because this can happen in any church, Baptist or Pentecostal, or any church. But it just so happened that these two people, uh, both ministers, uh, they don't call them pastors, they call them corporals or something like they got in there. But they were leaders in the church. One was a man, one was a woman. They was married, but not to each other. And every, and every Saturday, they had it at it for, for years, they would go to a hotel, have sexual intercourse together, and immediately they finish, they get on the, they get on their knees and ask God to forgive them. Then next week, they go back to the same hotel, do the same thing again, and ask God to forgive them, then go back. Well, that is, if you're born again, and you will not carry on doing those things. You won't say, God forgive me, and immediately go out and do it. It's not, it, you don't practice, you don't live, you don't live in that kind of life. You, I'm not saying you won't ever sin. And I'm saying, you won't carry on doing it. You won't use prayer as an excuse to justify it and think you can carry on doing it. Because that is not, in, that is not the, uh, the fruit of a person that is born again. The fruit of the person is born again is that you do, yes, you, you have sinned, didn't have to, you know it's wrong to sin, you confess it, you turn away from it. You don't just carry on doing it and think, well, that's okay, I'm saved. You see, I, I don't believe a person can lose their salvation, but I do believe that there are some people that were never really saved to begin with. <laughs> and that is shown by the evidence of their life. The Bible says they went out from among us because they were not of us. Like we never knew. And Jesus said to a few people that weren't miracles, they said, we, cut, we, we cast out devils in your name, we work miracles in your name. And he said, depart from me, I never didn't say, I knew you one time. He said, I never knew you. Never. They were never his children. And there are people that come into a church, have a false conversion, they follow, they follow some sinner's prayer, and get them all worked up, and get them entertained to the gospel, and the preacher says, follow me in this prayer, Heavenly Father, and they repeat it, and they say, did you, did you believe it? Oh, yes, I believed it. Oh, then, then you're saved. And they take them to a, take them outside to a little counselling meeting with a few counsellors, and they bring them in. Say these are your brothers and sisters in Christ. They tell them that they are saved. The whole gospel message is wrong. There is a right gospel. But that's a, I, I'll, I'll cover these subjects more as I go on. But just to say that some people are not just because just because you can repeat words like a parrot. Doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you say something, copy somebody else's prayer, doesn't mean you're a Christian. You know, half the people that come to an altar call and say a sinner's prayer, you never see them again afterwards. But they get caught up in the emotion. And so I remember many years ago, I was a counsellor at one of these big evangelist, big, big American evangelist meetings. And this is what they taught us to do. When he gives the altar call, I want you that are in the meeting to be the first one to come running forward. Because that will, that will get everybody else running. So you come forward first, you'll get everybody else running. So you get this emotional stir up, the music gets, as the preacher's preaching, the man on the organ plays the music louder and louder and louder, and as he's preaching, the organ goes up, and there's emotion, and he gives the altar call, and all these people in the meeting that have been trained to run forward, run forward, and everybody else follows, follows them. <laughs> because you know what happens in a meeting, don't you? When you ask people to come forward, everybody looks to see who's going to go first. 
So they've got people trained to run forward. So they get caught up in a frenzy and they run forward. And then they say, uh, then they, oh, oh, all in the emotion, oh, I'll repeat this player after me. Take them outside, give them a few minutes, then say, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They were never really saved. You don't find that method in the Bible. You don't find people doing that in the scriptures. Okay. The amplified version of John 3, 9 makes it much clearer. No one born, begotten of God, deliberately, knowingly, and habitually practice sin. Now notice that, that, that these to me are the key words. After understanding John 1, that he's born of God, does not commit sin. The Amplified Bible, I think, amplifies it. That's why it's called the Amplified Bible. It's because it, it, it brings out more of the Greek and Hebrew text. Though I, I do not, I do not, but I still say the King James Version is the best. That's why I use it more than anybody else. But I will use, if I think another version helps, to, helps us to understand it, I will use it. No one born begotten of God deliberately, knowingly, or habitually practices sin. For God nature abides in him. His principles of life, the divine sperm, remains permanently in him. And he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. Sinning and practicing and making a habit of it is two different things. I'll tell you what I used to, and Sheila, Sheila you remember this in the West Indies. Yeah. There's an old saying, people used to say in the West Indies, someone does him in the arm thing. After what he's done to me, when I see him, I'm going to do this, and God is going to have to forgive me. <laughs> no, it's just like this, I heard about him did you wrong. Yeah. They'll say, if you do me so and so, you know, I'll pay you back, and God will have to forgive me. God's going to have to forgive me. That's presumptuous in my mind. <laughs> God doesn't have to do anything. And no Christian would deliberately go out and commit sin with the attitude that God is going to have to forgive me. But I'm just saying that in a Christian in a Christian life, there's a difference between deliberately and never turning away from sin. That's why the Bible says he that harbours iniquity in his heart, the Lord will not hear him. Mm -hmm. It's holding it, not letting go of something that you know is wrong. Okay. Um, Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God by the word of his grave, which is able to build you up and give you inheritance among all them that which are sanctified. So we're saying here that sanctification begins at the moment we are born. Mm -hmm. It starts there. Amen. God didn't finish with you. You know, some people just see earth as God's waiting room. <coughs> well, now I'm saved, I'm waiting for heaven. Well, it's wonderful to go to heaven, but God's got more for you down here than just heaven. If God, if, if all God wanted you to do was to go to heaven, you'd have died the moment you got saved. Mm -hmm. The moment you said, oh, the moment you repented, you'd be back to God's heaven. The reason that you're down here is because God's doing the work in your life and God's got a ministry and a purpose for you to achieve on here. Mm -hmm. It's not just about getting to heaven. In fact, what we should be worried about is not about getting to heaven. What we should be worried about is obeying him. That's what I should be on our mind today. Okay. Sanctification is where we are being made into his image. God is not trying to make you into Baptist. Neither is he trying to make you into Pentecostals. He is not trying to get you into a... To, now, I want to get this because this to me is where religion has gone wrong. They are trying to form you into the precepts of some man-made religion to fit in to some man-made standard. But God is not trying to make us like what the Baptists want us to be, like the Pentecostals want us to be, like the Lutheran want us to be, he wants us to, we are being shaped in his image. In his image. 